The smallest town in the state of Washington is the town of Grace. Here's a picture of the town sign. As you can see, it was established in 1906. It has only 12 citizens in its population right now. It was a bustling town in the 1920s and 30s, but the Great Depression practically wiped it out. There's not much in Grace now, but they do have a Costco. A fact that the citizens of Grace will not allow the citizens of their neighboring community, Woodenville, to forget. The mayor of Grace admits to boasting in Woodenville City Council meetings, we have a Costco and you don't. There's a rivalry, you see, between the two towns. Their borders are contiguous to one another. The citizens of Grace seem to be resentful of Woodenville. Maybe that's because in the 1990s, Woodenville attempted to annex Grace, but that attempt failed. And so what the citizens of Woodenville did, they voted to annex all the land around Grace, practically incorporating that little town into their own community. They refer to Grace as one of their neighborhoods. A designation the residents of Grace refused to accept. The Wikipedia page about Woodenville refers to Grace as a former community. That certainly further rankles the citizens of Grace. Most of the Costco employees who work in Grace actually live in Woodenville. The residents of Grace will not allow anyone to move into their town. Their official policy is no one can move in unless someone else first moves out. And they aren't moving out. The residents of Grace seem to especially not want anyone from Woodenville to move into their community. This sign was posted in Grace some years ago. They don't want any Woodenville immigrants in the town of Grace. Perhaps you've noticed in the telling of this story that the residents of Grace don't seem very gracious. <laughs> Do you find that ironic? That someone who lives in Grace would not be gracious? It seems illogical to us as Christians, doesn't it? Especially if that were a standalone statement. But I wonder, do we struggle with the same problems as the citizens of Grace, Washington? Living in Grace, do we sometimes struggle being gracious? Living in this relationship of grace with God, is graciousness not something we easily extend to others? Today we conclude our sermon series on grace. We will explore what it means to live in grace. We will see that God calls us to practice the same kind of grace toward others that we receive from him. In grace, we are called to graciousness. You see, God's grace does more than save us, as important as that is. It also changes us making us more gracious. Graciousness is the practice of kindness and compassion and thoughtfulness toward others. When we accept God's grace, we begin a lifelong journey of becoming more like Jesus and who was more gracious than him. He offered words of eternal life to the woman who had been married and divorced five times and was at that current time living in sin with her next man. That's graciousness. He spoke words of love and hope to a tax collector who made himself wealthy by cheating taxpayers. That's graciousness. He forgave a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. He accepted back a disciple who denied him. He prayed for the forgiveness of those who were crucifying him. Every act, a gracious one. When we accept God's grace, we change to become more like that, gracious. We are called to 
to be like Jesus and live being gracious. Philippians 4, 5 in the Christian Standard Bible says, Let your graciousness be known to everyone. Colossians 4, 6 in the New Revised Standard Version says, Let your speech always be gracious so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. And Ephesians 4.32 in the English Standard Version says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Graciousness is kindness and forgiveness and gentleness. It reflects the character of Jesus. Jesus once made a statement about repairing broken relationships which is a very gracious thing to do. Let's read that statement in Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out the fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. A gracious act and for a gracious purpose. The purpose is to win over the brother or sister who has offended you. Peter knew that graciousness like that would require a lot of forgiveness. And so after Jesus taught a little bit more about this, Peter interjected this question as it's found in verse 21 of that chapter. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus, what's the limit? If someone hurts me multiple times, shall I forgive up to seven times? If it's a habitual offender, I shouldn't be responsible beyond that, right? Jesus answered him in verse 22. I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Peter, you are always responsible to forgive. There is no limit to grace. And then Jesus told a story to illustrate his point. It's a story that you're familiar with. I'm sure as we read it, you will recognize it. It's a story about uh, exaggerated debts and unexpected grace and expected graciousness. Let's read that story in Matthew 18, beginning in verse 23. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to jailers until he could pay back all he owed. And then Jesus drove home the point of that parable when he said this in verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Turns out that parable is about us. We are the servant who owes a great debt 
and God is the king to whom we owe it. 10,000 talents of gold in today's economy measured by our dollar bills would be several billion dollars. That amount symbolizes the debt of our sin, which we cannot pay. The second servant in the parable represents anyone who has hurt or offended us. Their offense is minimal compared to our offense against God. The debt that servant owed equaled in today's dollars about 20 bucks. And so according to Jesus, however much someone has hurt us is insignificant compared to our offense against God. The king ordered that servant and his wife and his children and all of his possessions to be sold in order to pay the debt. They became slaves, sold into slavery. Even though all the amount of money he would have been collected, they would have collected from those sales would not have equaled the billions of dollars owed to him. The servant asked for mercy and he received it beyond his wildest dreams. He asked for more time to repay, which he could never have done. But the king graciously forgave the entire debt. And yet when that freshly forgiven servant saw someone who owed him $20, he became enraged. He accosted the man, demanding payment of the debt right then. And when that servant could not pay, he had him thrown into debtor's prison so he could work and make enough money to eventually pay the debt. You see the point of the story, right? When we consider how much God has forgiven us, it ought to produce a forgiving spirit in us toward others. Grace should produce graciousness. If you haven't already figured it out, this is the difficult sermon in the series. <laughs> Learning about God's grace to us has been a blessing. We want God to apply his grace. We are grateful that he is a God of grace. But practicing graciousness toward others is not so easy. For we have all been hurt, sometimes intentionally. We have all been wronged by someone. And we really don't want to be gracious toward that person. But Jesus teaches us that in the Christian faith, grace is unlimited. Up to seven times, Jesus? Is that how many times I extend grace of forgiveness to another? Up to seven? Oh, no, Jesus said. Not seven, but 77. Some translations read seven times seven or 70 times seven. The Greek could be translated either way. The point that Jesus was making is that the grace of forgiveness, that graciousness that we extend to others is to be unlimited. Limited forgiveness is the way of the world. What do you think Jesus came up with that symbolic number 77? Maybe it was a play on words, seven, no, 77. Or maybe he just kind of came to his mind and, and, and he just used it because it was a very high number. Or maybe he had in mind the Old Testament story of an obscure man named Lamech. Lamech was the fourth generation grandson of Cain, that same Cain who had killed his brother Abel. Lamech knew that God had promised vengeance times seven on anyone who tried to punish Cain by murdering him as well for murdering his brother. And this was God's way of stopping this, this endless cycle of vengeance taken upon one person after another after another. God said, if anyone kills Cain for killing Abel, then I will enact my vengeance against him seven times an awesome, awesome thing to, to consider. So Lamech, being Cain's grandson, accepted that protection from God on himself. He boasted a similar protection. Being that he was Cain's great, great, great grandson, he thought that that multiplied. Lamech killed a man who offended him, and then he claimed that God would protect him not just seven times like he had with Cain, but 77 times the vengeance that God would enact on anyone who tried to take his life 
for the murder he had committed. Let's read part of that in Genesis 4, 23 through 24. Listen to me, wives of Lamech. Hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged, avenged seven times, then Lamech will be avenged 77 times. He apparently thought very highly of himself. This was his attempt to illustrate unlimited vengeance. It was as if he was boasting with this warning. Look what happens if you cross me. I might take your life. And look what happened, might happen, will happen if you attempt to take my life in revenge. It will be much worse for you because God will enact his vengeance 77 times on you and your family. But he made that claim without God's endorsement. Lamech's claim to the right of vengeance is the way of the world. Forgiveness is not the way of our world. But Jesus dismissed that whole way of vengeance. His teaching is that unlimited grace is the way of God's people. Unlimited graciousness flows out of unlimited grace. The rabbis of Jesus' day taught that there was a, a forgiveness that we were responsible for, for but, but it was limited forgiveness. It was limited mercy. They said, you, can, you should forgive somebody three times for their offense to you, but beyond that, you are no longer responsible to forgive them, to extend the mercy. It was grace with limits. It's the same kind of practice that your credit card company has. You know how that works, right? You run up a bill on your credit card. You have a 30-day grace period to pay that bill. But after 30 days, the grace ends. Then excessive fees will be attached to any remaining balance in your account. Grace has limits in our world, but not in God's. Jesus knew, or I'm sorry, Peter knew that Jesus was a very gracious person. And so when he reacted to the story that Jesus told and to the statement he made about forgiving, he doubled what the rabbis suggested. Nah, not three. Let's go twice that, six. And let's add one for good measure. Because he knew that Jesus was such a gracious person. So will we forgive then up to seven times Jesus? He probably thought that that was a very gracious sounding offer that he was making. And Peter said, or Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times. Grace is to be unlimited. Peter wanted to know how high to count. Jesus said, don't keep score. Graciousness is unlimited. Graciousness is to be an act of our will. What I mean by that is not based on our emotions or our feelings about the hurt that we have experienced at someone else's actions. We must practice graciousness even if it means suppressing our pain and our anger. There are two different words used in this story and the interaction between Jesus and Peter for our English concept of forgive. The first Greek word means to release the offender. Forgive by releasing them of their responsibility to be accountable for what they've done to you. Release the offender. Peter used that word in verse 21, when he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive? How many times shall I release my brother, the offender, who has sinned against me? And then Jesus used that same word in verse 27 in the telling of a story when he said, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. He released that servant of his responsibility to repay his a debt. Peter asked, how many times must I forgive? Before retaliating, Jesus said, release your offender from all responsibility. That's the first concept of forgiveness that comes out in the words that were used. The second Greek word that was used here means to be slow to anger. Jesus used that word twice when he told the story in both, verse, in ver, both verses 26 and 29 when we read the words in italicized print, be patient with me. He's really asking, give me more time. Be slow to come to anger and forgive me. That's the concept there. That word in the Greek is pronounced makrothumeia. It's a compound word made of two Greek words. The word macro, which is the opposite of micro. It doesn't mean small, but it means large. In the context of time, it means a long time. 
and the word thumeia, which is a word which means fierce anger that boils over. We understand that. We've been there, haven't we? And so when Jesus put those two words together and formed that word macrothumeia, he describes a process of being long in coming to the boiling point. If you've ever done much cooking, you know the value of that, don't you? When we put a soup in a pot on the on the stove, we, we don't turn it all the way up to high and leave it there. It'll scald the soup. It'll burn whatever's lying on the bottom of the pan. It'll boil over and ruin the stove top. But we turn the heat up just enough so that it evenly cooks at a slow pace. That's the idea of, that Jesus was expressing. He was saying, turn your anger down. Forgive before it boils over. Control your pain and anger. Don't lead with those emotions, but be gracious. We must sometimes will ourselves to do that because we don't feel like being gracious to the person who has offended us. Several years ago, I had a series of discussions with a man who would not forgive. When someone offended him, he held on to a grudge uh, for that person indefinitely. Over many, many years, he had accumulated a lot of enemies in his mind, people that he would just wouldn't forgive because they had hurt him in some way. He wouldn't let go of their pain. He told me, I wish I could forgive them, but I can't. I asked him why he couldn't. He said, because I don't feel like forgiving. He was waiting for a feeling, but he kept replaying the hurt that those people caused to him in his mind over and over so frequently that the pain would never go away. His feelings never changed. I told him to stop waiting for a feeling and forgive anyway because it's the right thing to do. Some would say, well, that's hypocrisy, doing what you don't feel like doing. No, that's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means doing something you don't believe is the right thing. To do something you don't feel like doing because it's the right thing to do, that's not hypocrisy. That's maturity. We should all rise to that maturity. It's a trait of good character. Here are four suggestions I would like to offer to help us to Overcome those feelings and to graciously forgive. First, determine that you will forgive. Don't allow your pain to dictate your behavior. Will yourself to do the right thing. Say forgiving words even if you don't feel like saying them. Secondly, make a genuine forgiveness effort. Face-to-face -face is best, but maybe the only opportunity for you to do that is through some kind of a letter. Offer an apology and forgiveness. And don't go into detail about how much that person's behaviors have hurt you. This isn't meant to induce guilt. It's meant to forgive guilt. Thirdly, release the offender from the debt of an apology. They may actually owe you an apology. Don't require it. Forgive them anyway. And finally, pray for the offender. Not that God will convict them of their wrong. Not that God will open their eyes to the error of their ways. Not that God will punish them for the hurt they have brought into your life. But instead, pray for that person's well-being. Pray for God's blessing on their lives. And over time, your scar-hardened heart will soften and heal. I know this is a difficult teaching, but it will bless you if you do it. One day this teaching blessed Peter. He had denied Jesus three times, and yet Jesus graciously forgave him. It's a good thing for Peter. It wasn't three strikes and you're out. It's a good thing for us, too. We need God's graciousness. And maybe someone else 
maybe right now, needs yours. Live in grace. Be gracious. And accept the grace of God if you haven't even gone, taken that step yet. He offers the grace of the forgiveness of your sin and it is, as we've learned these last few weeks, the only hope we have of being saved. The only hope of being in right relationship with us. He offers that grace continuously. He offers it right now. If you've never experienced the grace of forgiveness from a God who loves you and wants you to be his child, then he invites you to that relationship today. To accept him. To accept his son. To accept that sacrifice that was made for your sins so that they can be washed away and you can be saved. It's the grace of God. Come and accept it if you never have as we sing our invitation hymn.